inputs. We will be moving to the prize paper presentations directly. The panel discussion already we have got most of the questions, so there is no need for a separate panel discussion on the structural heart diseases. So we are moving forward to the paper prize presentation, and I hand it over to Dr. Aparna. Thank you, Dr. Miley. First, I would like to uh, welcome our esteemed judges for the oral paper presentation. Uh, Dr. Vanessa, Dr. Tarun Mittal and Dr. Sandeep will be the judges. Thank you so much for accepting this. I hope the presenters are here. So we'll first start with Dr. Basavraj. Dr. Basavraj will be presenting on right coronary artery pericoronary fat attenuation index as a future predictor for acute coronary events and non-obstructive coronary artery disease. We'll just wait for Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Basaraj from Sri Chitra Technology Institute, Trivandrum. I am here to present our study on right coronary artery, pericoronary FAI, as a predictor for future acute coronary events in non-obstructive coronary artery disease, a prospective single center study. So coronary inflammation is considered the central driver of atherogenesis, resulting in ischemic heart disease. However, it's not detectable with routinely used imaging modalities. Studies have demonstrated that there is a bidirectional crosstalk between the vascular wall and perivascular adipose tissue. So in coronary inflammation, the vascular wall inflammation induces changes in the pericoronary fat in the form of reduction in lipid content and the size of adipocytes. So this produces a CT attenuation gradient in the pericoronary adipose tissue, which can be quantified using a new CT angiography methodology called fat attenuation index. This pericoronary fat attenuation index is considered the novel imaging biomarker of coronary inflammation. However, the ability of PCAT FAI to predict MACE is unknown. Literature review showed that there are only few studies in this direction, and majority of these studies are retrospective in nature and involving heterogeneous patient population from candidates one to five patients. So we conducted a study to assess the predictive value of pericoronary FAI as a marker for major coronary events in non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Since most of the patients with candidates four and five usually go for revascularization or TABG, we conducted a study in candidates one to three categories. This was a prospective cohort study involving all the consecutive coronary angiograms done between 2014 to 2021 using 256 slice Philips Blender CT scanner. Inclusion criteria were candidates 1 to 3, and uh, <coughs> in candidates 3, the coronary obstruction was uh, ruled out after negative results with stress CMT or CAG with FFR. Exclusion criteria were candidates 0, 4, and 5, patients for CABG or coronary stenting. PCAT FAI was measured using semi-automated Syngovia uh, coronary plaque analysis from Siemens. And then these patients were followed up for development of any acute coronary events, including unstable angina, NSTEMI, or STEMI. So the CT coronary angiogram images were retrieved from PACS into the Syngovia software. And the uh, uh, segmentation was done for the segment involving coronary plaque, followed by measurement of uh, the degree of stenosis 
and plaque analysis. This was followed by measurement of FI around the segment containing the plaque. The pericoronary uh, fat was defined as a radial distance equal to the uh, diameter of the underlying coronary segment. And the HU values for fat were uh, threshold was set between minus 30 and minus 200. And also in all the patients, we measured FI values of proximal RCA, the proximal pore centimeter, excluding the first 10 mm, so as to avoid the, uh, the effects of the aortic wall. Coming to results, a total of 120 patients were included in the study with a mean follow-up period of 67 months. Of these, 21 cases developed acute coronary events, including 13 unstable angina and 8 NSTEMIs. The actual event-free survival rate in our study at the end of five years was 89.2%. And there was significant difference in the event-free survival rates between candidates 1, 2, and 3 categories, as well as when candidates 1 and 2 were com compared against candidates 3, the former category had a high event-free survival rate. In our study, the mean RCA PCAT FA was minus 80, and the mean lesion PCAT FA was minus 79 HU. The values were <coughs> relatively lower compared to uh, the values in the literature, including the landmark CRISP CT study, where the mean FA was minus 75.1. This could be due to the population involved uh, in the studies, com in the Indian population compared to the Western population in these studies. Also, uh, the the FA values were significantly higher in the MACE group compared to the patients without events in both RCA FA as well as lesion PCAT FA. So uh, the cross-proportional regression analysis was done to identify the significant risk factors for MACE. On invariate analysis, both RCA FA as well as lesion FA uh, were significant risk factors, whereas on multivariate analysis, RCA FA was a significant independent predictor of MACE, whereas lesion FA was not. On performing ROC curve analysis for predicting the uh, maze, both RCA and lesion FA uh, showed good predictability, but RCA, uh, the RCA FA was a better predictor of maze events at a cutoff value of minus 77.3 HU with high sensitivity and specificity with area under curve of 0.9. A representative case of a 56-year male with atypical chest pain, uh, the CT coronary angiogram shows uh, Stenosis of 37 degree, 37 percent in LAD segment six. The lesion uh, PCAT FA was minus 78.6, whereas the RCA FA was minus 74.6, which was much higher compared to cutoff study, uh, cutoff in our study of minus 77. So when this patient was followed up, after 47 months, he developed unstable angina, and the coronary angiogram done showed 60 percent stenosis in proximal LAD, and he underwent PCA to LAD. So to conclude, our study. Uh, shows that the RCA FA can be used as a surrogate marker for global coronary vascular inflammation. And the predict prediction for MACE events is better with RCA FA compared to lesion FA. And high values of RCA FA can be used as a predictor for future MACE events. So identification of high risk patient in this cohort of non-obstructive coronary artery disease has a potential for risk stratification and primary prevention initiatives. However, there is a need for standardization of CT thresholds of inflammation as well as prospective studies with larger sample sizes. These are my references. Thank you. Hello. There we go. Hello. Hi. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, very you. good. Congratulations. And uh, now, with all the uh, you know uh, uh, abstracts, we'll ask um, you know number one is uh, what did you uh, personally contribute to this study? Can you let us know what you personally did uh, in this study? Uh, Madam, I I did all the analysis myself. I retrieved the images into the software and calculated all the FA values. And the statistical part, I didn't do it myself. The rest of the study was done entirely by me. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we have some questions for you, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent uh, study. Uh, may I ask, uh, you know, your, in your pa patient cohort of 120 patients, the event rate was in 21 patients had events. Yes, that's a very high rate of event rate of almost uh, 20%. In, uh, so what was your, uh, what was the nature of those 120 patients you had? Uh, the, patient, okay. 
the patient presentations were with atypical chest pain with intermediate probability but mm -hmm. on analysis questions also had other comorbidities including diabetes hypertension and dyslipidemia right. which i included in my study so did what were these patients admitted because of acute chest pain or were they patients with stable chest pain happening for last few weeks uh, they were stable sir not admitted patients okay because that's a very high event rate so uh, you wonder what was uh, because in in all the most of the studies in stable chest pain patients event rate is very very low you know it's less than 1% uh, per year or so so that's a very high event rate so you just wondering whether these patients had high uh, they were having acute unstable angina like uh, presentations to start with and that's why you see such a high event rate but uh, otherwise yours yeah, yes. Otherwise, your study is quite yeah, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for presenting uh, excellent study. Um, I agree with what Tarun said. Not only the event rate is high, but there's alarmingly fast progression of the narrowing of the coronary arteries that these patients had in a short amount of time. Uh, so a uh, question for you is, do, did you only have a single data point for coronary CT, or did the patient have another coronary CT uh, at the time of the diagnosis of acute chest pain when they came back after their follow-up? No, sir, we don't have follow-up CT uh, because most of them were followed up. Then when they had next episodes, most of them have undergone direct coronary angios, invasive angios. So the follow-up CTs, we are taken at one point, the initial presentation. And then we are followed up for the events directly. Clinically. Uh, and then uh, my second question is, you mentioned that a lot of these patients had obesity and other risk factors. Yes, uh, do you look at if there is any association between yes. the uh, eat and um, like mediastinal fat and pericoronary fat uh, and intrapericardial fat uh, versus uh, what you identified in your study, the FAI? Uh, was there any correlation? Mm, sir, the, these variables are taken into account for multivariate analysis. So even for on multivariate, the diabetes uh, patients as well as uh, stenosis more than 50 percent these also were independent risk factors for mace events but i had not calculated the epicardial fat that was not a part of our study sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. thank you for clarification thank you For me, um, I, I don't read coronary CT. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. uh, no, we don't use it clinically. Uh, we uh, have some ongoing research projects where we're looking at uh, the same thing. Uh, the general thinking is that uh, people uh, tend to perceive that the, the fat around the coronaries is like an endocrine system in itself. There is a to and fro transmission of a lot of chemicals uh, back and forth from the coronary wall into the fat. Uh, uh, so we had looked at, uh, not the FAI, but uh, another thing that happens when these patients present with acute chest pain is that when the plaque ruptures, it creates a lot of fat stranding uh, at the site of the culprit plaque. Uh, and so th that's, uh, that has been another observation, in my opinion. So his observation is that in a, in a non-obstructive artery, which is an RCA, right? That was your reference point. Yeah. Right. There's an increase in your fat attenuation index, which can be a predictor for a MACE event. Correct, yeah. Which is a non-obstructive uh, an, an artery. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, we had around uh, 20 patients with vulnerable plaque, but they didn't show any significant association with MACE in our study. But it was also used for uh, analysis, ma'am. And how many of them had a low attenuation uh, uh, component within it, which is supposed to be Less than one of the factors which is uh, responsible for rupture? Mm, around five to six were there, sir. So actually, so just just for my doubt, so we are looking at asymptomatic patients with a high fat attenuation index in a non-obstructive artery as a surrogate marker for an event. And Absolutely. we are not looking at the fat attenuation index around a non-significant stenotic lesion with the vulnerable plaque, with the high-risk uh, morphology. Uh, yeah. You understood the two, two, there are two variables. One is 
a non-obstructive normal artery and its attenuation index of the fat around it. The second, second is a non-significant uh, stenotic segment with the plaque showing a high risk morphology showing a high fat attenuation index. So, so I think these two are two different. One would probably predict that it might, might rupture. The other one is saying that maybe the mace fact that, that the chance of you having a mace event is high. Is it what is this what the thought process is? Yeah, I think we need a larger cohort to further delineate. You know the different the the relationship between the FAI and the uh, the plaque features. I think that's probably better. So I think we need to move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next presenter will be Dr. Hari Prasad on prediction of significant coronary disease in patients with calcium score of zero. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Hari Prasad Shetty. I'm a cardiac imaging fellow in Narayana Hridayala, Bangalore. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a study we did where we tried to predict the uh, significant coronary artery disease in patients with calcium score of zero. Uh, as we know, cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death and disability in the world. It was responsible for about 31.8% of the deaths globally uh, in the year 2017. And most of the deaths comes from uh, India and especially Asia. And there has been a two-fold increase in the number of prevalent uh, cases of uh, cardiovascular disease from 25.7 million in 1992 to 54.5 million in 2016. Uh, due to this high disease burden, uh, screening is of foremost importance and coronary artery calcium score has been uh, being an uh, uh, surrogate marker of atherosclerotic burden is emerging as an important screening tool. But does calcium score means uh, zero means that there is no disease, the answer is no. Uh, there have been various studies uh, which have show, showed that about 1.9 to 3.5% of the patients with calcium score zero have a significant coronary artery disease, that is uh, uh, stenosis of more than 50%. So even in our data, there has been 2.7% of the patients with calcium score zero had a significant coronary artery disease. So we tried to uh, look into the traditional risk factor in these patients and how they can predict uh, uh, the, the occurrence of significant coronary artery disease in these patients. So it was a single study uh, center study uh, between January 2006 and December 2020. All the patients who underwent calcium score, that is uh, 36,437 patients, uh, were included. Uh, ethical clearance was taken from the uh, ethical clearance committee. A total of 19,378 uh, patients out of all this had uh, zero calcium score. Of this, we had a risk profiling of about 9,452 uh, patients. The various risk factors we looked into were the gender, diabetes, hypertension, chest pain, uh, smoking history, and a positive family history. So to summarize our patients, the mean age of uh, the, all the patients we had was 47 years. About 62 patients were male. Uh, diabetes was there in 23%, and about half of them had hypertension and chest pain and smoking history was present in 13%, and family, positive family history was present in 28%. So this is the table showing the association of the various risk factors and uh, the significant coronary artery disease in these patients. As you can see, uh, most of the risk factors, especially uh, male gender diabetes and smoke, uh, smokers have a significant association with the significant occurrence of significant coronary artery disease. But this, uh, but this table doesn't tell us how much these risk factors can predict the occurrence. So we tried to come up with a model, and uh, we came up with a model called generalized linear model, uh, which establishes a linear relationship between the risk factors and its occurrence, uh, where the underlying is actually not linear. So we tried to come up with an uh, estimated value uh, to, to what extent can risk factor can cause a significant coronary artery disease. And based on this data, we came up with a scoring or as you can see in the last column, it came up with the scoring or a weightage factor for each of the risk factor to what extent it can cause in uh, significant coronary artery disease. So with this data uh, and uh, 
uh, with this data, we, uh, we analyzed 20% of the uh, patients and came up with an uh, cutoff value of four, which had a uh, sensitivity of 77% and a negative predictive value of 98.9%. Uh, so to going back to our scoring, so uh, our cutoff was four. So going back to our scoring, uh, if, if uh, say, a female patient with diabetes and chest pain uh, came to us, the, the, the likelihood is very less because the, cutoff, uh, the score will be three, which is less than the cutoff score of four. But uh, say a male gender with any of uh, the risk factors will have a more chance of having a significant coronary artery disease because uh, it will usually come up, uh, the, the community score will come more than four. So to summarize, about 2.7% uh, with zero calcium will have significant coronary artery disease. And in this patient, the, uh, the presence of risk factor can predict the occurrence. So by using our model in which the cutoff score of more, uh, four or more will have a high negative pre uh, pre uh, predictive value and we can confidently predict significant coronary artery disease in such patients. To conclude, uh, calcium score of zero should not be always equated to the absence of uh, coronary artery disease and this is the first predictive model on a large scale which take in, takes into account other traditional risk factors uh, to, to, uh, to predict the occurrence in these patients. So by this model, we can make coronary artery as a better screening tool uh, in detection of coronary artery disease. The limitation of our study was it was a single st center study and clinical outcome was not analyzed. Uh, and it's in the process of follow-up. Uh, these are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much, a very good presentation. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, number one is, uh, what did you personally contribute to this study? Uh, what did you do? The study was done uh, before I joined NH, uh, long before I joined NH, but uh, I contributed to the research, I mean, the statistics and computing of all the data. Okay, great, thank you. I wanted to ask you a question. Your conclusion, one of your conclusion was that you significantly improved risk prediction by using the calcium score zero and the cutoff of four. So how did you come up with the conclusion that it improved compared to using traditional risk factors? Um, did you do an analysis where you only use, you know, the traditional risk factors to pre predict, you know, events or disease compared to, oh, if you added, you know, the calcium score zero with the cutoff of four, did you do that actual comparison? Uh, this, in this, because it was a larger scale study, in this study we only took the patients of calcium score zero and uh, saw risk factors in these patients. But on a larger scale, we have, have one more study in which uh, we have looked into all type, all variants of uh, calcium score and saw risk factors in these patients. Okay, so so I guess there wasn't like an, um, uh, you know, a, a actual direct comparison to using, oh, just, you know, risk factors. You it know, only it, it, conventional risk factors, like without the, because you see what I'm asking, like y you are saying that using this, you significantly improved yes. the risk prediction. So I'm asking, you know, how did we come up with the conclusion that it significantly improved the risk prediction uh, without comparing to, you know, what, like, am I being clear? <laughs> because you know, the, uh, what Dr. Ferreira is saying here is that uh, we already know that the risk factors, patients age, sex, they predict the yeah. pre-test likelihood of coronary artery disease. So how, uh, how did the, how did in your study cohort in zero calcium score, how much, how much was that prediction better or worse? I think that comparison is what she's asking for. But maybe you didn't look at that, so that's fine, that's fine. So what I would like to say that in this study, what is your, the prevalence of calcium score of zero in your population is very similar to what we find in Western populations. So that's very reassuring that that data is no different. And what is also important is that the, the power of zero calcium score is what your study is showing, that if you have zero calcium score, then the probability of having more than 50% stenosis is only, you know, less than 3%. If we know that if you put all those patients, that 3% patients, through stress imaging and catheter angiography, only half of them would have truly flow limiting stenosis. So uh, a zero calcium score, in fact, means that 
it, it, it has a negative predictive value of almost uh, you know, 99% or more. That's what the studies are now showing. So calcium score of zero actually becomes a very good uh, you know, screening tool for significant, to exclude significant coronary artery disease. I think that's where the power lies of, of this particular study. Nice presentation. Uh, I just wanted to applaud uh, the sheer number of patients that you have in your study. Uh, is phenomenal. Uh, so congratulations on putting together a large data set of patients. Thank you. Uh, second, uh, you mentioned that uh, the you um, these patients, some of them got diagnosed with uh, significant coronary artery disease. How was that diagnosis made? Uh, the uh, coronary angiogram was done. I mean, CT coronary angiogram was done. Okay, and so, and I'm assuming that these patients, did they get started on some sort of statin because they had non-zero calcium score? Even if the calcium score was four, did they get started on statins? No. 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 Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. No. Thank you very much. Dr. Jihendran Mary Varunya on utility of cardiac MR in appropriate selection of patients requiring font and operation. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Mary, fellow in cardiothoracic imaging from NH Bangalore. I'll be presenting the findings of our study, utility of CMR in the appropriate selection of patients requiring font and completion. So the background for my study, single ventricle is a disorder of embryogenesis whereby there is a anatomical or physiological loss of a ventricle. The conditions that constitute single ventricle include hypoplastic left heart syndrome, common inlet atrioventricular connections like double inlet left ventricle, double inlet right ventricle, absence of one atrioventricular connection like tricuspid atresia, mitral atresia, unbalanced AVSD as in common atrioventricular wall with one well-developed ventricle, and heterotaxy syndromes with only one fully developed ventricle. In all these conditions, surgical repair would uh, include diversion of the systemic venous return directly to the pulmonary arteries, thereby effectively bypassing the ventricle. So this is done as a staged procedure, whereby SBC is connected to the pulmonary artery directly, which is known as the BD Glenn procedure, followed by a fontan completion, whereby the IVC is connected to the pulmonary arteries. So this is an MRI coronal post-contrast angioimage showing an intact glen and fontan surgery. So post-glen and prior to fontan surgery, patients routinely and traditionally undergo catheterization to uh, get certain parameters which determine the suitability for fontan completion. These, known as the CHOSETS criteria, are requirement for a normal systemic venous return, a normal RA volume, mean pulmonary artery pressure of less than 15 mm Hg, pulmonary arteriolar resistance of less than four woods units per meter square, pulmonary artery to iota ratio of greater than 0.75, normal ventricular function with ejection fraction of more than 60%, absent atrioventricular valve regurgitation, and no impairing effect of previous shunt, as in there's a glen already done, and if there are venovenous collaterals, it uh, will impair the uh, fontan probability. So of all these criteria, other than for the pressure, pressure data and the pulmonary arteriolar resistance, cardiac MRI can be used to evaluate the rest of the parameters. While catheterization uh, can evaluate all the parameters except the uh, atrioventricular valve regurgitation for which it is not so sensitive. So our aims were to determine the efficacy of CMR in assessing pre fontan suitability in single ventricle physiology patients and to compare the anatomic uh, findings and the hemodynamic data of cardiac MRI with that of cardiac catheterization. It was a single center prospective study done during the duration of September 2021 to December 2022 with proper ethical clearance. All patients with single ventricle physiology post superior cavopulmonary anastomosis were included and a CMR and CAT were done in the same sitting or within 20, 48 hours of each other. Our total sample size was 31. So our protocol included a localizer and black blood images in axial plane, CINE images including CINE stacks, and contrast enhanced angiography for venous collaterals and other vascular anomalies, and uh, phase contrast Q flows for IOTA, MPA, RPA, LPA, SVC, IVC, and all the pulmonary veins and delayed enhancement images. 
So our results were as follows. Uh, the mean age of our population was 13.7, with the age ranging from 4.5 to 27 years. There was a slight female predilection, with 58% of our population being female. And the dominant ventricle was the left ventricle in 55% of the patients. So the predominant anatomical configuration was that of tricuspid atresia in 15 patients out of the 31. And on comparison of the cardiac MRI and cardiac catheter parameters, there was a high correlation using the Pearson correlation coefficient for the size of pulmonary arteries as well as the Megone index, while there was moderate correlation for the Nakata index. And uh, when AV valve regurgitations were compared, there was moderate agreement for the right AV valve regurgitation, while there was poor agreement for the left AV valve regurgitation. Also, CMR showed a comparatively higher degree of AV valve regurgitation compared to CATH. I can say CATH was less sensitive in picking up mild AV regurgitations. And based on the cardiac MRI, it was determined that four patients were unsuitable candidates for fontan completion, of which two had severe valvular regurgitation and two had systemic ventricular dysfunction. Also, there was statistically significant correlation between right ventricular end diastolic pressures on CATH and on indexed right ventricular end diastolic volumes in, pa in subjects with RV or sy systemic ventricle, while the same data for the left ventricle was not correlating. So the limitations of our study, uh, we didn't have a long-term or long-term follow-up or post-operative outcome comparison for this. And cardiac catheter, uh, catheterization is the gold standard for end diastolic pressures pulmonary artery pressures and pulmonary vascular resistance, but the corresponding surrogates uh, are not available for cardiac MRI. And as we all know, cardiac MRI is the gold standard for Q-flows, cardiac output, and ventricular systolic function, and the surrogates for these parameters are not available in CATH. So my conclusion, cardiac MRI should be considered as the first-line investigation or rather the gatekeeper in pre fontan evaluation. So post-CMR, if the patients have uh, features favorable for Fontan on cardiac MRI, limited catheterization can be done just for the pressure data, thereby decreasing uh, the unnecessary exposure of radiation. And if patients are deemed unsuitable for Fontan at CMR, further cath is not advocated. These are my references. Thank you very much for that nice presentation. And again, uh, can you tell us what you personally did in this study? I was involved in the CMR analysis, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, when, uh, when you uh, said that uh, cath is not a good test for uh, regurgitation, uh, I think it's not, not at all surprising because it, that is not the modality. Uh, at least in the adult valvular space, people generally don't use cath for diagnosis of regurgitation. Um, Nico so, would be better. Yeah, so, uh, but I uh, would be curious to know if you took into account whether these patients had uh, uh, transesophageal or transthoracic echocardiograms and uh, how well the CMR correlated uh, with uh, regurgitation. We routinely have only transthoracic echocardiograms done for all these patients. Sir. I also have a question um, about the correlation. Um, I think in your table you said that the CMR um, measures correlated well with the cath, and I wondered about uh, actual agreement. Like you know, th they will correlate, but was there actually agreement? Yeah, really? ma'am, there was sixty to seventy percent uh, correlation. Oh, I know it's correlated, but what about agreement? Like correlating something doesn't mean agree, but you know, let's say. Yeah, um, okay. point yeah. six to point eight percent, like point eight agreement on the, when we calculated the Fleish Kappa, it was point six to point eight, okay, I think, right. moderate agreement, moderate agreement it was. Okay, um, you know, th because you, you also mentioned that, you know, the CMR can't measure the pulmonary arterial resistance. Um, um, there are these new pixelized perfusion mapping um, that can measure myocardial blood flow at rest and also at stress. And so when we inject a bolus of gadolinium, it will go through the venous system and then into the right ventricle, into the pulmonary um, circulation, into the left, at the LV, and then out the circulation. And you can actually measure something called pulmonary transit time. Yes, and I wonder, would, would that be useful to you? you know, in assessing, um, you know, as a surrogate, you know, for the 
to your illnesses. But my cardiologist would, would still want to do a cat for the precious mum. <laughs> Maybe we can try it out. We can work on it. Any other question from the audience? literature is DAL will be almost equal to the tricuspid atresia. You, are, you have only one or two cases, no? DALV? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank thanks, you so thanks much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. Amrish Kumar on cardiac MR appearances in muscular dystrophies and correlation with echocardiography. Uh, good afternoon to one and all present here. I'm Dr. Amrish. I'm a cardiothoracic fellow in RNA Health Institute, Bangalore. And I'm here to present my talk on cardiac MRI appearances in mu muscular dystrophy and correlation with echocardiography. Uh, just a basic. Uh, muscular dystrophies are the diverse group of congenital disorder of rare genetic disease, mainly the X-linked recessive pattern. The instance is 1 in 5,000 main newborn, and prevalence is 6 cases in 1 lakh males. Muscular dystrophy is primarily characterized by progressive muscle loss and limb weakness. Muscular dystrophy is mainly associated with cardiomyopathy, and it could be one of the main cause of sudden cardiac death in young patients. Cardiac MRI is an emerging as the modality of choice and non-invasive assessment of these patients. So uh, we try to identify and describe the cardiac MRI appearances of muscular dystrophy patients, and we also wanted to correlate it with echocardiography. Uh, it is a single center uh, retrospective study for the past five years between Jan 2017 to December 2022. All the patients with muscular dystrophy were included in the study. We used our Philips 3T engineer machine with our standard imaging protocol that included the CINE two chamber, four chamber short axis, then T1 and T2 mapping, late gadolinium enhancement, and we also uh, took the data for the global longitudinal strain analysis. And these were compared with that of the echocardiography. So we decided to analyze these parameters, that is the region of all motion, then left and right ventricular, uh, ventricular ejection fraction, late carinium enhancement, native T1 value, and global longitudinal strain. We also thought, why don't we try to bring up a pattern if it is there with correlation with the gene. So we had a total of 34 patients in the study. The range of age was between 7 to 28 years, mean being 17.5 and all the patients were main, as it is an X-linked recessive pattern. Out of the 34 patients in muscular dystrophy, we had uh, 28 patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and six were Becker's muscular dystrophy. Uh, comparing the left and the right ven uh, ventricular ejection fraction, we found that there was a good correlation between the echo and the MR. Uh, MR showed that there was 55.6 percentage was an average, and in echo it was 59.2, and right ventricular ejection fraction was about 53.2 in MR. Comparing the global longitudinal strain, all the patients in our study had deranged global longitudinal strain. The mean being in MRI was minus 13.5 and echo was minus 15.9%. Uh, moving on to the reasonable motion abnormality. Uh, in all the 34 patients, we found that there was a reasonable motion abnormality predominantly involving the lateral wall, which comprised approximately 79%. And uh, some patients showed uh, septal involvement, which was about 21%. Uh, late gadolinium enhancement. All the patients had mid myocardial enhancement, predominantly in the lateral wall, was seen in 42%. And this late gadolinium enhancement was correlating with that of the regional wall motion abnormality in echo and in MR. So what we found was there was uh, almost 42% of mid myocardial or epicardial enhancement, and we found no enhancements in 20 patients that was about 28%, uh, 58%. Uh, native T1 value. 18 pa uh, patients had raised native T1 value in our study, which was about 52%. Uh, then moving on to the gene correlation, we found that the dystrophin gene was the main gene which was responsible for this, and uh, gene exon between 45 to 55 was the most commonly seen gene which had the muscular dystrophy thing. Uh, to summarize my presentation, uh, we had good correlation between cardiac MR and echocardiography on the terms of regional motion abnormality, global longitudinal strain, and LV ejection fraction. All the cases showed deranged global longitudinal strain in our study. Majority of the cases showed late gadolinium enhancement in mid myocardium, 
and predominantly in the lateral wall. And all the patients, majority of the patients had raised native T1 value. Uh, even though we tried to uh, put a specific pattern for the gene, we couldn't find any specific pattern for comparison with the enhancement or the global longitudinal strain. My limitations in the study were it's a single center study, an intra-observer variation could be there. No long-term follow-up was found. To conclude, uh, cardiac MRI is a good non-invasive imaging modality, and it's helpful in early detection of cardiac involvement in muscular dystrophy patients. Uh, other assessments like uh, fibrosis and uh, right ventricular functional assessment can be done in MR. And there was a good correlation between MR and echocardiography in my study. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And can you tell us what your personal contribution is to the study? Yeah, uh, we tried, I'm getting, it's being a retrospective study. We took the patient with muscular dystrophy and we tried to find out the gene pattern which was involved. And I was mainly into the statistical work of this patient. Great, thank you. And I have a question. What was the motivation for designing this study? Um, like say, for example, why did you want to correlate CMR with ECHO? Why are you looking at that? Is it because, oh, you want to use either mode? If, if you were to find the results are, oh, they agree with each other, then I can use either modality? Or are you trying to demonstrate one may be better than the other in terms of offering additional information? What was the motivation? Uh, the motivation being like we want to find out what additional information can MRA give on more than the echocardiography. And the other thing was uh, we tried to even correlate the gene parameters in this study. So we want to know if this particular gene is positive in that patient we could expect something in MRA of being any specific pattern or not. That was the major motive in the study. Okay. And did you find anything uh, uh, no. like that? Yeah. Maybe, no, maybe too few patients at we the moment. We did uh, 34 patients, but we couldn't find any specific pattern. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good study. And I think you, this could be maybe the largest series of muscular dystrophy uh, patients who have had cardiac MR. So congratulations on that. And I think like uh, Dr. Ferreira, I was also wondering why it was a need to correlate with echocardiography uh, because we know that CMR is gold standard for vol measuring volume, ejection fraction, and, uh, and late guide enhancement and mapping, et cetera. So that was also, uh, so you, this study could have been just on its own, mm -hmm. nice, just with your first objective. Mm -hmm. Second objective, in my view, is not really required. Yeah. But otherwise, it's a good study. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, great presentation. Uh, thank you. And uh, excellent number of patients, as Tarun rightfully pointed out. Um, I have a sort of a logistical question uh, to you and your team. Uh, these patients, when they come to get their MRI, uh, because they don't have much of uh, skeletal muscle, mm -hmm. uh, their respiratory muscles are weak, uh, so they have trouble holding breath. Uh, how so with that context? Yeah. Uh, uh, how long was your uh, CMR protocol? Uh, as in, how long these patients were in the scan? Yeah, uh, it, it is about approximately one hour, but we do the free breathing sequences. So even if the patient is not able to hold their breath, we are okay, and we have good image. So we are able to estimate and evaluate with based on those images. Okay. So all of them are free breathing sequences. Uh, it depends if they are not able to hold their breath then we go for the free breathing technique, or else if they are able to hold their breath, we just, I mean, the, uh, we just do it in phases. So we just ask them to hold their breath for 30 seconds, give them a break, and again ask them to hold for 30 seconds. Okay, and my next question is, uh, because you found late guideline enhancement, were they put on any, what change in their management? Because presence of LGE in uh, muscular dystrophy is considered a bad prognostic mm -hmm. marker. Uh, so do you have um, any uh, follow-up coming on on those patients uh, in terms of how the MR changed? Uh, we uh, don't have a follow-up on those patients, but okay. I will anyway go through it again. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the other point I just want to uh, ask is uh, these patients should have had dilated cardiomyopathy. Yes, sir. Uh, but ejection fraction was fairly normal range, right? So they were not having poor L left ventricular ejection fraction. Right. What about the volumes and diastolic and systolic volumes? Uh, what they the large? indexed were within the normal range. So even I mean, they are like early dilated, or they were not all not all patients were dilated. They were in the border range of early dilatation. 
Okay. Right. And they had a far good uh, LV addiction fraction also. Okay. So does that mean that these patients were picked up because of their systemic features of muscular dystrophies? Yes, sir. And they were having cardiac MRIs? Yes, sir. As part of that, not because they presented with heart failure as the... usually costs 8 crores in India, uh, which is uh, quite expensive. Uh, I can buy five of my houses in that money. So we do have a lot of crowdfunding program going on, and as part of that crowdfunding and before selection, all muscular dystrophy patients, they go through ECHO as a standard, but the main reason for comparison was ECHO was not finding many things and we were looking for late GAD enhancement in these patients to say, MR is showing you this. But the other thing which we found was they used to, before sending to us, they said the GLS is okay, so we don't need it. Our GLS and their GLS, again, did not correlate at all. So that was the main reason for correlating it. And a lot of these are children in their young age, and hence they are very early in the disease. So that's why we are not seeing a DCM picture in them. They are very early in their disease. When they are late in their disease, that's where the anesthesia issues, lying down issues becomes a problem. We've had kids who just could not lie down at all in there. Thank you, Vimal, for clarifying that. That would have been a really good motivation statement for this study, like you know, the, high, you know, the, 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 the current knowledge gap or the current deficiency would have been echo, you know, whatever you just said, you know, wasn't detecting the things or saying that strain was normal when actually it isn't. So we wanted to systemically evaluate this to identify, you know, what the issues are, that that would have made it, you know, quite clear as to why you were doing this study. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I have one query. Uh, uh, because uh, you don't have any correlation between the, uh, the uh, uh, scar or the elevated D1 versus the genetic thing. Do you have any correlation between uh, the age or the symptom, uh, whether uh, when the patient is symptomatic, more likely to have a scar, or if the no, older the age, there is a more likely to have a scar under the elevated T1? Uh, no, sir, we don't have any correlation about that. But uh, what we found was majority of them had lateral wall involvement, and uh, enhancement pattern was also seen there. So, and it was on all age ranges, it was present. Muscular dystrophies, you had mentioned most of them were Beckers and uh, Duchenne's. Yeah. So, how are they, this is out of the cardiac thing, how are they diagnosed? And uh, was any uh, clinically or by muscle biopsy or? The muscle biopsy was done for these patients and they were proven cases of muscular dystrophy. Okay, and the, any uh, muscle MRI was done just to uh, do they do as a protocol? No. Sir. MRI? No. Okay, so, but there was uh, any. Uh, whole body muscle, uh, limb girdle muscle dystrophy, all these were not included as part of the study? No, sir. Okay, okay. I invite the next speaker, recurring speaker, accuracy of traditional risk factors in comparison to coronary calcium scoring for risk stratification of coronary disease in large Indians, a large Simbi center study. Dr. Hadi Prashad, sir. Uh, good afternoon again. Now I'll be talking about the accuracy of traditional risk factors in comparison to coronary calcium scoring for risk stratification of coronary artery disease in Indians. So again, uh, as I told earlier, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and uh, disability in the world. Uh, it was responsible for about 32% of the death globally uh, in 2017. And this, in, uh, this uh, incidence is on the rise. And in India, the state level disease burden study of the global burden of disease study group showed there is a twofold increase in the number of uh, prevalent cases of uh, coronary vascular diseases uh, from 1990 to 2016. 
the conventional risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, smoking, obesity are always believed to be associated with the uh, increased prevalence of coronary artery disease in Indians. Uh, so uh, keeping in this in mind, uh, early detection becomes very important. And the traditional screening tools have been uh, electrocardiography, uh, echocardiography, and red uh, test. Calcium score recently has come uh, is an upcoming uh, non-invasive and a better predict uh, better predictor and a good uh, screening tool. Uh, there have been lot of there have been few studies like the MISA, that is a multi-ethnic uh, study of atherosclerosis, have shown that uh, increase in calcium score has caused uh, uh, there is more incidence of occurrence of uh, major coronary events. So what we did this, uh, we tried to uh, look into how, how the traditional factors and uh, coronary uh, calcium score stack up, uh, stack up against each other in predicting the significant coronary artery disease in Indians. So it was a uh, single center study done from January 2006 to uh, December 2020. All patients, that is 36,437, who underwent uh, CT coronary angiography uh, were included. Uh, we ha of this, we had a risk profiling of about 17,141 patients. And the risk factor that were analyzed were gender, diabetes, hypertension, chest pain, smoking history, and positive family history. And the various uh, calcium score, score uh, we, uh, we are group, uh, were divided into calcium score of 0, calcium score of 1 to 10, calcium score of uh, 11 to 100, uh, 101 to 1,000, and more than 1,000. Uh, this is a summary of all the parameters uh, in, the, in our patients. Uh, the mean age of our patients were 51 years, and uh, about 70% uh, uh, were males, and about one-third had diabetes. Uh, about half of them had uh, chest pain and hypertension. 14% uh, were uh, smokers, and to about 29% had a positive family history. And uh, this is the various categories our patients were, uh, calcium score categories our patients fell uh, into. Most of them were, uh, again, calcium score zero. And uh, these are the various ranges we found. And uh, this is the table which showed the uh, association between significant coronary artery disease and these various risk factors and the calcium score. As you can see, there is, uh, even though we could establish a good association between the risk factors and calcium scoring with the uh, occurrence of uh, significant coronary artery disease, the, uh, we couldn't uh, exactly tell how to what extent these risk factors uh, can cause a uh, significant coronary artery disease. So we tried to come up with a model called a generalized linear model, which gives an uh, estimated uh, value uh, uh, to, to what extent can each risk factor or a calcium score can cause a uh, significant coronary artery disease. Uh, with this uh, data in mind, we, uh, with this data in hand, we came up with an uh, scoring or an weightage factor for each of these parameters. So as you can see here, uh, more than, as compared to any other traditional risk factors, uh, calcium scores had a more weightage factor. Uh, so uh, upon this data, we, uh, we, had, uh, we cam came up with a cutoff score of 30, uh, 30 or more, which had a uh, sensitivity of 88%, a specificity of about 76%, and then uh, negative predictive value of about 96.6%. Uh, so the patients with less than 30 had an 96.6% uh, uh, chances of not having a significant coronary artery disease. To uh, summarize, traditional risk factors were always thought of as the best predictor of coronary artery disease, but as we can see from our study, from our scoring, the calcium score predicts it better than uh, any other, uh, any other uh, risk factors. So if you consider a patient with, uh, having all the risk factors, it still won't come up to our cutoff value of 30, whereas a, a calcium score of just more than 100 is uh, single-handedly uh, comes to the more than our cutoff score of 30. So to conclude, uh, coronary artery calcium scoring is the, by far the strongest pr predictor of significant coronary artery disease in Indians. This is the first of its kind and the largest study in India. And our cutoff score of more than 30 has a high negative predictive value, uh, value and this should be in, uh, used in uh, calcium scores should be used in conjugations with uh, the traditional risk uh, factors for risk satisfying of all coronary artery diseases. And as we can found from our study, calcium score of more than 101 is the single most important predictor of occurrence of significant coronary artery disease. The limitations of our study were it was a single st uh, center study and the clinical outcome was not analyzed. These are my references. Thank you.
Hello again. <laughs> Good presentation. And so um, what's the contribution um, from you similar to the previous yeah, study? Yeah. yeah, okay, all right. So now, here, I'm going to ask you the same question. That, you know, because um, if you go back to your ROC curve, um, you, you show one curve, right? You know, with the area under the curve of 88, you know, with the score of 30. Um, oh, they, they've skipped over the slides. I wanted to look at it, actually. Um, is it possible to bring them back? <laughs> The, um, because, you know, your, your table has, um, you, you know, you, your, the table before your rock curves had all the traditional risk factors yeah. and you gave them scores and then you had the calcium scores yeah. and everything. What I was asking you in the previous presentation would have been on your rock curve, can you put, you know, can you create a rock curve that predicts whatever outcome you're looking at with just the traditional risk factors, and it will have an area under the curve, I don't know, make up something, you know, 70%, and then with your calcium scoring, it improved to 88%. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you, you yeah. should put the other parameters in different combinations in the same rock curve so you can see how the different rock curves compare to each other and you can do statistical analysis to see that right you know me incorporating all these things with the calcium score significantly improved the risk prediction ability compared to just using traditional factors that would have been convincing and then you tell me that you know what in your clinical practice you should use calcium score beyond just the traditional risk factors that's what i was saying and that's a very important point. Again, a large cohort of patients, excellent, you know, in Indian population, probably the first study of this kind. What I would say is that uh, it seems from your, the title, title of your study that you are looking at the accuracy of traditional risk factors in comparison to calcium scoring for risk stratification of coronary artery disease. But you are not actually, you did not look at risk you're looking at the prevalence of obstructive or more than 50% stenosis. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so they're two different things. So I will always uh, say that we have to be very clear exactly what we are looking at. So you're looking at how the two compare in terms of predicting more than 50% coronary artery stenosis on CTCA. That's what we're looking at. So that's the first point. Second point is that from that same table, if, you, if someone can bring up that slide, uh, please, uh, where you have give the score for different uh, factors. The next one, maybe. The next one, next one, yeah. Yeah, this one here. So here, what we are seeing is that uh, the score of the calcium score category is, is so high, and that of the risk factors is so low, you may wonder, you can completely ignore the risk factors here. So if you created a model like what uh, Vanessa said, then you would have, might have found that the, the, the area under the curve for the model comprising of the calcium score is much, much higher than just the traditional risk factors. So that would be very nice to do, that model. Yeah, but so that, that, that would be nice to see. Okay, that's, uh, those are the comments I would like to make. Thank you. Uh, again, great study and congratulations for doing a large uh, scale study like this. Takes a lot of time and effort as uh, you all know it. Um, with regards to the scoring, do you have like a distribution data on uh, whether there were any disparities between the gender and age group of the uh, patients in their 40s and 50s and 60s? Uh, that would be something uh, really interesting to look at. Otherwise, uh, the only other thing that is missing uh, from your paper from making it perfect uh, is the plaque volume uh, quantification mm -hmm. and to see how it fares along with uh, the, uh, the variables that you've already uh, put together. Uh, those were my comments, but good job, thanks. Uh, if I could just, uh, Vanessa and Tarun, I think that's a great idea. We did not compare the traditional risk factors as a bulk against that. So I think that's a very good uh, suggestion for us. The one p powerful thing of this study, what we realized was in India, a lot of places we've started doing calcium score 
as a standard health checkup. And it's come off and a lot of educational uh, content about the 2.7%, which is really good because I expected it to be much higher in Indian population because the Western population says 1.9 to 3.5. I expected people with a zero calcium score in India will have more coronary artery disease, but we also fit in with everybody else. The intent there was, if you have a zero calcium score, can we predict which of those patients will be in that 3% group? And that is where we said, if you have zero calcium score, let's look at your risk factors. Can we predict you will have disease or you will not have disease? And the way we've come up with these scores is basically amongst the 36,000 data, 80% of the data was used to build this table score. And what you're seeing that ROC curves are for the 20% test data. So this model we built in the 80% and it trained the model and different options, different, and then we trained it. And the calcium score, we first went with the MISA of saying, let's do zero, zero to uh, one to 100, 100 to 400. 100 to 400 just skewed the data so badly for us that just by calcium score, you can predict coronary artery disease. So this is, I think for the general people uh, in the crowd, it's very important to understand that calcium score value in India is very, very high. We need to utilize it in more and more clinical cases. And uh, for people who are struggling to get coronary CT referrals, start with calcium scores. You will get hundreds of calcium score on a week if you just start that service in India. Yeah, just just ask Vimal something and you also, that what proportion of these patients who are asymptomatic coming for health checkup like program? Uh, asymptomatic was 40% of patients in terms of acute symptoms. Mm -hmm. But if you look at generic symptoms, Indians come uh, and say, I want a checkup and you say, uh, do you have any symptoms? I've been getting short of breath for the last six months. Right which makes it very difficult for us to actually say, are they symptomatic or asymptomatic? Mm. But 52%, uh, if I'm not wrong, had chest pain. Okay. Uh, the, the, reason, yeah. the reason why that's important is we have to differentiate in any clinical scenario whether patient is truly asymptomatic or has symptoms. Because if it's asymptomatic, then we are not looking for obstructive coronary artery disease in those patients. We are simply looking at the burden of atheroma, that's all. And uh, if the calcium score is absent or zero in those asymptomatic people, we can say they are fairly safe in their long, medium, long-term risk is very low of developing coronary artery events. But if they have a degree of calcium, then the, the risk of having events increases depending upon the degree of calcium score. So that's very important. Thank you, yes. treatment protocols are set. Have you tried to remove that data of diabetes and see how do your data perform? Because no, no. diabetes just uh, kind of, you know, it, it, once you say you're diabetic, you know, we know that, that this, you will go on the, the highest level of preventive uh, management. So is there any thought process on that? No, we have not tried to. So all of these were individually analyzed and each got a score. So diabetes actually did not get that higher score. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, well done, thank you. The next presenter will be Dr. Kodishwar. His talk is on comparing non-contrast T1 mapping with T2 star mapping MRI for cardiac iron overload in thalassemia patients on three test labs. Good afternoon each and everyone here. Uh, myself, Dr. Kodi Shwana, doing residency in Ruby Hall Clinic, Pune. So, uh, as Sar mentioned, my topic of interest here is comparing non-contrast T1 mapping with T2 star MRI for cardiac iron overload in thalassemia patients on three Tesla MRI. 
so background introduction the speak the this picture speaks itself i think so india has the largest thalassemia patients in the world so all the thalassemia patients have the uh, have the have the significant mortality rate due to cardiac issues so these patients will be having lot of transfusion pre frequent transfusions that will then the patients will end up in uh, cardiac iron overload so the cardiac iron overload is causing the 15 to 50 percent mortality in those patients so uh, little bit introduction as we uh, as we all know thalassemia will have the impaired beta chain synthesis and then when uh, it will trigger the early destruction of the precursor rbcs but uh, it will initially in the reticular endothelial system and then gradually it will go into the myocytes hepatocytes and cardiac cells and endocrine glands but, uh, since the reticular endothelial uh, system have highest rbc turnover uh, but these cardiac cells are more sensitive to the iron overload than other cells and then our aim here is to establish a correlation between native myocardial t1 values and then myocardial t2 star values in the thalassemia patients we are achieving this by assessing the myocardial iron overload using t2 star mri and then we are determining the correlation between t2 star values and then myocardial t1 values so how we are doing that uh, we did a prospective observational study single center large scale study uh, conducted within department of radio diagnosis in ruby hall clinic pune uh, individuals of indian origin uh, who refer to our center for cardiac mri has been enrolled in this study with proper consent and cardiac t2 star and the myocardial iron concentration values are calculated using a formula reported by carpenter et al in our scanner and study population the normal range for t1 mapping for healthy individuals is set at 1180 to 1290 mm when i am mentioning this i will also like to mention that this t1 mapping uh, reference value is not standard for the all mri machines and all type of like 1.5 3t so this reference standard will arrive by uh, it it will be assigned for every mri scanner based on their uh, machine and then their local population so based on this uh, based on our study we we set the reference standard at 1180 to 1290 mm and uh, when we are looking at the results we did a uh, 200 study population study among that 37 subjects that is 18.5 percent had cardiac iron overload on t2 star out of this 10 um, uh, 27 percent had mild cardiac iron overload 40.5 percent had moderate cardiac iron overload and 32.4 percentage of population had severe cardiac iron overload so all the patients with reduced t2 star values significant cardiac iron overload also manifested low t1 values that is below 1180 milliseconds one interesting finding we got also is among 43 individuals exhibited t1 values below normal range despite the t2 star value is normal so a subgroup have normal t2 star value but it is showing below normal range t1 value that uh, that's what interested uh, finding that that's what interesting finding in the uh, study so as you can see here in t1 t1 color map comparison this is a patient with no cardiac iron overload of t1 value uh, 1 to 0 1 and when we are seeing the moderate iron overload patient in figure 2 we can see the color map uh, sensitivity here with the t1 value of 984 so this is the comparison of norm no iron overload patient and mild cardiac iron overload moderate cardiac iron overload and severe cardiac iron overload so uh, when we are mentioning actual t2 star cutoff point for normal t in ideal uh, ideal machine in ideal setting it will be in uh, 30 millisecond but since uh, because of the inhomogeneity in magnetic field we set the normal value at 20 millisecond this itself ha this by this itself we know the limitation of t2 star mri so the new emerging tool t1 mapping will eliminate uh, will eliminate the uh, drawback and here you can see in the spreadsheet the normal t2 star range here uh, is more than 220 when you are looking at the t1 values of the same patients in y axis these patients still showing the cardiac iron load iron overload even though the t2 star range is normal so 
as far as limitations are concerned, uh, when we are doing T2 star MRI, since the ion is a paramagnetic substance, it will cause the inhomogeneity in magnetic field and the artifacts are more. That will potentially affect the interpretation of cardiac ion overload using T2 star MRI. In T1 mapping, we can overcome this uh, drawback and we can predict the cardiac ion overload better than T2 star MRI. That's what we can see here. Uh, here you can see the cardiac ion overload uh, has been found in 37 patients out of uh, 181 patients. Uh, but in these patients, 43 patients have cardiac ion overload even though it, is, it has not been picked up in T2 star value. So in conclusion, T1 mapping is very convenient, reduces the analysis time and it will provide the pictorial ion overload visualization instantly that will enhance the representation. So early diagnosis of ion overload cardiomyopathy is paramount in the management of thalassemia patients. To predict it in the early stage, T1 mapping is more sensitive in uh, predicting the cardiac ion overload. A subgroup, as we mentioned here, even though they have a normal T2 star value, low T1 values highlights the potential of T1 mapping in the early ion uh, early ion overload in the cardiac region. Now, native T1 mapping at 3T emerges as a promising tool for comprehensive myocardial ion assessment. It improves the timely intervention and patient outcome. References. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Very interesting. And uh, again, uh, your personal contribution to this research study. Uh, Ma'am, I'm mostly involved in the analysis of CMR and getting the values in T1 mapping and T2 stuff. Okay. Statistics is, I, I'm not involved in statistics. Okay, thank you. And a quick question, who are these patients? Like, you know, study population, like, you know, what, what are they, are they all beta thalassemia Mom, patient? Uh, yeah. All patients are hematologically diagnosed beta thalassemia major. Okay, and do you have their ferritin levels? I know they don't yes. necessarily so correlate with So in this know. study, we conduct, uh, we, uh, took the data on serum ferritin, but it showed a negative correlation in this study. Yeah. It does not have any correlation in this study with the hepatic ion overload as well as cardiac ion overload. Right, right. Yes. Okay, now I'm gonna ask a bit of a controversial question to you. Now there have been two papers published already comparing T2 star and native T1 values in patients with myocardial iron overload. Those papers were published by um, uh, Pennell's group and uh, James Wynn and Oxford in collaboration. So we published two studies showing very similar correlation. May I ask you, um, what made you do the study again? Um, uh, whenever we are taking the cardiac ion overload patients, so the early detection is potentially important because the patient will not have symptoms in the initial stages. All those patients have cardiac iron overload will present with symptom later. So when we pick up at the early stage, we can start the chelation, uh, chelation therapy, and then we can monitor the cardiac ion load, and accordingly we can decrease the mortality in those patients. Because cardiac mortality is the, uh, cardiac mortality is the leading cause of mortality in thalassemia patients. That is the motive to take up the study. So let me, um, yeah, do you know the, the previous two papers, um, do you know what field strength they were published in? what MRI scanner field strength they were published in, you know, the previous two papers that I talked about. Uh, I didn't know. They were published in 1.5 yes. Tesla. And, um, and the reason why we used 1.5 Tesla was because conventionally, the guidelines say do not do T2 star at 3T because T2 star has issues at 3T with, um, you know, in homogeneity, you know, and things like that. That's why T2 star, normally, clinically, we would do it at 1.5. But I would say that maybe the novel aspect of your study is that, okay, you know, it's limited to 1.5, but I'm gonna try to do it at 3T because native T1 mapping works on 3T, right? It doesn't have these issues and you compare it to T2 star, and what you're finding is that, well, you know, the, the native T1 mapping could be the alternative to use at 3T. If T2 star is having such problems at 3T for clinical applications, then maybe for 3T, you should use T1 mapping, right? So, so there's something new that you're doing um, 
de defend, defend your, your, your research, defend it, you know, because otherwise people are going to say, you know, there are two other papers already, this looks the same, and you say, no, 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 they published it in 1.5T, and, you know, I did it at 3T, and they hadn't done that. Well, you have the master of mapping sitting here, so <laughs> very, very careful what you what you're presenting on this topic. Um, my question to you is, uh, you know, th those patients who had uh, T2 star more than 20, but T1 value lower than 1,180 millisecond. So how do you know they are abnormal? They have iron overload. How do you know that degree of T1, which is just slightly lower than your lower limit of normal? How do you know that represents iron overload? So the, since, since we have the uh, large population in thalassemia patients in our, pay, uh, in our uh, center, and we conducted this T1 value assessment in other normal patients also. So we did a phantom and arrived at the normal range. So how many patients you had in, your, in the volunt normal volunteers? We had 200 patients in this study. No, no, normal volunteers. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, how do you validate that those lower T1 values, but uh, above 20 millisecond T2 star values, they are really abnormal? How, do you, how would you validate that? Yeah. How do you know they have iron in their heart? You know, for those patients who have a T2 star value of above 20 milliseconds and yet they have low T1 values, how do we know they actually have little bits of iron in their heart? Uh, exactly. No worries, no worries, yeah. No, so that's something to think about, you know, before we call them truly abnormal, we need to know how, how we call them truly abnormal. Just by those numbers, we cannot say for sure. Un 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 until and unless we validate them in some other way. I, I think it's very difficult because you're not going to be oh, getting biopsies, you know, in the heart. And so you don't have cardiac tissue. None of us know, you know, none of us know that because we get challenged about this. Like, okay, so your T1 mapping is somehow more sensitive, but how do we know it's just not oversensitive and just calling, you know, people who have loaded, they don't have iron, you just, you know. Uh, so it would be maybe, if you had something like, oh, these beta thalassemia patients, they were to undergo x you know, treatment to, you know, or, right, to remove the iron and the T1 values, you know, improve, that's evidence that it's tracking something biological inside their heart or, st you know, something like that. So I think you, you need to correlate it to some biological parameter. But, you know, we know that blood tests you know, of ferritin, iron and things, they don't, you know, necessarily correlate with what's going on. So I think, you know, probably following treatment response may be a way to go. Because when you submit this paper, the reviewers will ask you this question. Uh, excellent, excellent point. So actually that was the, uh, the initial thought behind this study that we have started uh, doing T2 star on three Tesla machines. And then we actually wanted to validate that, you know, we can work on three Tesla for T2 star as well. Just to, uh, so that's why we have correlated with the T1 mapping because T1 mapping is much more robust on three Tesla. And so that we are, you know, uh, making the foundation whether we can, you know, uh, have a additional correlation with the T1 mapping, we can give the better diagnosis in that terms. And as you rightly said, we, we don't know, means let's say our cutoff is 1180 and the patient is coming with the 1100 T1, uh, T1 value, then it is just lower than the cutoff value. So we, we, we will not be sure on, uh, because it will, it will not correlate with the serum ferritin. And as you, as you rightly said, we, we cannot have a myocardial biopsies much more often. And uh, actually our, the next part of this uh, study is the follow-up patients. Uh, we will be assessing the T2 star as well as the T1 mapping uh, values in these patients as well. So, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, two quick comments. I, I completely agree with what Vanessa said, and uh, this comes up from time to time because there are, there are patients who just uh, erroneously sometimes get scanned on 3T, 3T and then 
Then somebody asked us the question, uh, by the way, I'm also considering cardiac iron overload. Uh, what was the GP star value there? Uh, so it will be really important to get the follow-ups going on these patients. So that, that would be one comment. Second, it would be really nice to know uh, if there is a cardiac dysfunction in these patients, uh, what were their uh, ventricular volumetry like, what was the ejection fraction. Um, so uh, consider adding that uh, to your database. Uh, I have one query uh, to Dr. Nesava. Actually, in uh, T2 star in 1.5, we have a value for mild, moderate, severe, like you know, less than 5, we'll call it as uh, severe, 5 to 10, moderate, say less than 10, uh, 10 to 20 is uh, mild. So anything, uh, something you have for the T1 mapping to call it as a mild, moderate, severe, any cutoff for numbers? Uh? Yeah, no, because I think there was some issue with validating it with tissue iron, like even the liver iron. You know, so for current reporting, you know, for us, you know, we, we separate into cardiac and liver, right? Usually it's a combination. They say, look for cardiac and iron overload, and then we do the protocol for heart and then the liver. And so if it's lower than 20, we'll just say, yep, it's low. And we don't separate the heart into mild, you know, moderate severe. And then for the liver, there are some liver, I think it's because you could validate it. If it you know, I don't think there's the same validation in the heart. And I uh, seem to remember that there was some technical issue with validating T1 mapping, you know, with, with iron, there's something about the formaldehyde and uh, messing up the T1 value, like th there was something about that. I have to ask those people um, who publish, you know, as first author, Dan Sado uh, and them. Yeah. So in, in my practice, we uh, report the number, uh, whatever it, uh, it is, uh, the value for T2 star, and then for the SCMR uh, three-tier categorization, we also say this is low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. Uh, so just those two, I'm not aware of any quantitative cutoff. The, the problem um, might be that it is, it's, it's not substantially low than a normal T1 rate. Uh, and we need to have uh, at least long-term data uh, until we, because as you rightfully said, how do we know that it's high, right? So, and one of the ways to get around would be to have multiple time points. Yeah. Good, no, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. sir. Thanks a lot. So that was the last uh, presentation in the in competition the category. Please go ahead. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everybody. That was a really exciting uh, you know, session with uh, very interesting research here from India. And uh, you know, it's really nice to see you know, the early career researchers participating in research so enthusiastically. So um, we're, the judges are now going to compile the scores, and then we'll come up with the winner. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, everyone. Big thank you to our esteemed judges. Thank you so much for accepting. I, I request uh, our international faculty to stay back because we are heading to an interesting session that's price distribution. So I please request you guys to stay back. So we will take a few minutes to honor the dedication, hard work, and talent of 15 delegates in eight different categories for IAS, IACI 2023 in Coimbatore. So the first award is for the best publication award category. We had eight submissions and it was judged by our international faculty, Dr. Tarun Mittal and Dr. Avanti Gulhane. So the award goes to Mansi Verma. Is she here? Uh, uh, she had a publication on lung water estimation on CMR for predicting adverse cardiovascular outcomes in patients with heart failure. So we also had consolation prizes for oral presentations who were uh, under non-competitive category. So we have three equal prizes. So the first uh, first of these three is Dr. 
Apratin Roy Chaudhary from SCTIMST Trivandrum. <laughs> Role of CMR imaging in patients with endomyocardial fibrosis. Anybody from that institute? Uh, there is also Dr. Deepmala Karmakar from the same institute, and her uh, uh, paper was 4D cardiovascular MR flow analysis and velocity mapping of alteration of RV flow patterns and main pulmonary artery hemodynamics in patients with repair talk. No, okay. So both of them you will be collecting and give it to. Can I invite Dr. Sandeep to do the honors, please? So the third of the consolation prizes, all of three same marks, so it's just uh, by number, the order. Dr. Jahendar Mary Varunya from Narana Institute of Cardiac Sciences. She presented on LGE patterns in genetic cardiomyopathy and Indian experience. Dr. Venisa, if you could do the honors, please. And then we had uh, the next categories, scientific exhibits, exhibits e-poster. And this was judged by Dr. Lilia Ciara and Dr. Tarun Mittal. Third prize goes to S. Ramya from BIR for pictorial review of anomalous pulmonary vein connections. Anybody from BIR? Yes, come on. Can I ask Tarun to do the honors, please? So the third place was shared by Dr. Anjali Banti from Jupiter Roll of, for, uh, for role of CMR in Minoka. Obstructive coronary artery disease is not always the cause of MI. Can I ask Dr. Venisa to do the honors? The second place goes to Dr. Lohit Kumar from CMC Vellore. Diagnostic role of CMR in evaluating cardiovascular sarcoidosis. Can I ask Dr. Sandeep to do the honors? Sandeep, if you could stay back for the first prize as well. The first place goes to Dr. Shashikant Kumar from CMC Vellore. Comprehensive stepwise approach to pulmonary hypertension on CT. We had 22 entries for educational exhibits and five for scientific. All right, so the next one is the interesting case. We had 30 entries. It was judged by Dr. Johan and Dr. Mahesh Bannur. Two prizes, both first places. Dr. Vanishri from Valenal Medical College, Madurai. Anybody from that institute? Her case was DCRV with VST. The next is uh, for Dr. Amarish Kumar from Narayan Hridalaya for undiagnosed PDA CMR to rescue. Can I ask Dr. Tarun to do the honors? So 
next category is the case of the month. So this is for Dr. Niva B. Hypervascular lesion, tumor, or pseudoaneurysm from Amrita Institute of Sciences. Can I ask Dr. Venisa to do the honors? This was among 11 entries that we had. Neva, I think you should stay back because you, and Venisa to stay back as well because she has another award, second prize in this competition. <laughs> so if you could stay back, Venisa, we have second prize for Basavraj Biradar. and Deep Mala Karmakar. So the first place was for uh, Amol Kulkarni, but uh, since he had to leave, we've given away the prize. So thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll. I'll give the mic now to Dr. Aparna because I think we are ready with the results for our competitive paper. Uh, actually, it's uh, easy now. Both the prizes actually go to Dr. Hari Prasad Chetty for both his papers. Congratulations. <laughs> So that's the end of the pre uh, presentation for prize distribution. So we'll break for lunch. Short break, 10 minutes. Please be back.